should be now. Nope. You can just see me looking around. Hmm. Did you say 25 minutes ago you could? Alright, we can't have that. There is that delay. We're a few minutes till. I wanted to get started just a few minutes early, give people a chance to show up and to make sure I knew what I was doing and getting this going and online. So we'll be starting right at about nine o'clock. Uh, thanks to those of you that have gone ahead and, and uh, uh, gotten set up. So just wanted to make sure everything was working on my end. And like I said, we'll be starting like right at nine. Um, I also have, uh, and I'll say this again once we get officially going, uh, I have Amy sitting off to the side. Uh, as well. So if any of you have questions at all uh, during this, feel free, go ahead and put those in the chat and then Amy can relay those to me and I will answer those to the best of my ability uh, in here. If, uh, if I can't answer one uh, at the time, then I'll go ahead and come back to the chat later and, and make sure that I get everything updated. Uh, any questions I was not able to address during the class. So uh, just a, a couple more minutes and uh, uh, we'll get started right at nine o'clock.
All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I've got just after nine o'clock, wanted to go ahead and get started with class this morning. Um, if uh, you didn't get to read ahead, it's a fairly short passage. We'll be looking at 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 4. And uh, if you do have your Bibles, would ask that you go ahead and turn there. I'll kind of set the stage for some things to begin with uh, before we jump right into it. But uh, So it should give you some time to be able to get uh, to that passage if, uh, if you need that. So I <clears throat> uh, also want to let you know, and I... I that uh, I do have Amy here helping me out. She's off to the side. And so if you have any questions at all uh, while we're broadcasting or, you know, something that I say catches your attention uh, and you want to know a little bit more, please feel free to ask. Uh, she'll be fielding those questions and let me know if anything comes up, anything that uh, I need to address a little bit more or uh, uh, maybe kind of raises some questions on, on your part and you just want to know more about it. And uh, I'll help out wherever I can and answer whatever I can. Uh, if I can't answer it during the class, then I'll come back to the comment thread over here and make sure that, uh, that I address whatever those are uh, in this case uh, in, in the class. So uh, I do want to throw out as well a question uh, for you guys to be thinking about. It's something I know Sam has been doing with the teens. Uh, there is an app called Zoom and uh, Zoom gives you like meeting capabilities. Some of you may have used it with work or things like that. Uh, and so you have live interaction with uh, the people that you're talking to. There's like a raise hand feature there. Uh, you can interactively talk over the microphone to people and those types of things. So uh, I wanna throw that out as maybe a possible uh, different solution to Facebook Live for a Bible class for next week. Um, so I'll probably, uh, I'll see if I can get with Jeremy and maybe get a poll put up on the central page and you guys can kind of respond to that. And, and if we get enough response, maybe we can spin off another, uh, a different class or, or uh, do this class in a different format next week that allows us a little more interactivity. So, uh, but uh, with all that said, uh, like I said, I'll try to get something up on the Facebook page about all of that. But with all that said, let's go ahead and jump into uh, our passage today. So I'm going to start out by reading 1 Kings chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4. And once we read that, then I'll, I'll kind of help set the stage for us uh, in where we are in a uh, timeline of David's life and uh, just some other things that, are, that have kind of gone on to build up to this point. So I'll be reading 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So it says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So again, we have here kind of David's uh, last words, uh, if you will, to, to Solomon. And, um, you know, when we kind of consider somebody's last words, I was just watching a movie last night, uh, or a TV series yesterday, sorry about that, and uh, a, a gentleman was... Had, had just passed away or was, was you know, kind of his, was dying, right? And, and his last words that he left uh, to those who were in his presence were what he felt were, were those most important words uh, that he needed to get across, that he wanted people to know uh, were those last things that he said. And, and so when we consider this time of David, these are kind of his last recorded words, and they're to Solomon. And, and so he has some very stern things to say to Solomon, as well as uh, some other uh, things just to kind of maybe challenge Solomon uh, in, in all that he's got that's, that's going to be coming up in his life. 
So to kind of set the stage here, though, for, for David and for Solomon and how, how things got the way they are, uh, we have David had uh, 20 sons. If you look at the biblical account, uh, there are 20 sons that are listed, and that's including the son that died uh, to Bathsheba, her first son. Um, so there were 20 sons, and then there are potentially uh, another two or three more that are unnamed if you look historically. So they're uh, that uh, died under similar similar types of circumstances, you know, before they were of uh, a naming age, which would have been at eight days old. So when we look at all of this, right, timeline wise, we've got all of these sons, uh, and Amnon was David's oldest. Uh, I never can remember the name of David's second son, but then we have Absalom. Those are kind of the two big names, Absalom and Amnon. Uh, they had a, a, a big event that took place in 2 Samuel um, where Amnon was killed by Absalom because of the rape of Tamar. And then you have Absalom is the one who uh, was prophesied, uh, would, uh, would actually try to take the throne. Uh, from David, he's the one who slept with uh, David's concubines on the roof of the uh, uh, the roof of the palace and all of that, and so, uh, and 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 then Absalom was was the one that died most recently. But any way you look at it, uh, when we look at twenty different sons, at best Solomon was seventh in line, and at worst Solomon was tenth in line if we include Amnon and Absalom. If you take those out, then that means he was either fifth or seventh in line. And I'll get into kind of some of that in just a little bit as we talk about kind of the debate around the age of Solomon at this time. Uh, so we have Adonijah, who was David's oldest living son at the time. Uh, and Adonijah has, has stepped up and tried to take the throne. David in his old age is even having trouble keeping warm. Uh, so there is a young virgin who was assigned to care for the king and to help him to uh, to take care of him. Uh, her name was Abishag, and so uh, so she was charged with that. And then Adonijah decides that you know what he's next in line. He's the next oldest. He's going to step up and uh, and try to take the throne, even while David's still alive. Um, David didn't know anything about what was going on yet. Nathan and Abigail uh, heard about this meeting that Adonijah had with Joab, who was David's uncle and his head general, and Abiathar, who was the current high priest. So David has a meeting with them and trying to figure out, excuse me, not David, but uh, uh, Adonijah has a meeting with them and trying to figure out the best way uh, to take the throne. And, uh, and Nathan and Bathsheba bring this to David, and he then, that's when we come to 1 Chronicles 28 and 29, where we have David making this public announcement that Solomon is going to be the next king, not Adonijah, not any of the other brothers who are older than Solomon in the lineage. Uh, it's going to be Solomon will be the next king. And then finally, we come to these words in 1 Kings chapter 2, which are these final words that David has just for Solomon himself. Um, if you remember, I put up on the Facebook page kind of the reading of First Chronicles 28 and 29. That builds the public uh, display of all of this and David's public announcement of it all. And then we come to his final private words uh, to Solomon in First Kings chapter 2, where we just read. So let's kind of look at what, um, what David had to say uh, to Solomon here, because there's a couple of things that David had to say uh, to Solomon. You know, if you remember, oh, I just stepped through all of that. Forgot I had slides. Sorry about that. So we just read 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, the first thing that he tells him, when we look to verse 2 here, uh, when we look to verse 2, the first thing that David has to say to Solomon is, hey, grow up. Uh, grow up, Solomon. He says, you know, this is, this is going to be a time that's going to be so hard for you. You're not going to know what to do. Uh, and so as, as a part of this, the first thing you need to do is you need to grow up. Now, that, that got me kind of wondering about kind of the age of Solomon to try to put some context to David's comment here. You know, is he saying this to a young boy? Is he saying this to an older man? Uh, kind of what are we talking about in this situation? So for this, uh, it's interesting. There's actually quite a bit of debate around, and I say debate, uh, conversation maybe around the age of Solomon at this time. 
If we look traditionally, uh, Jewish rabbis have him uh, in Jewish tradition, says that David was between the ages of 12 and 14. Sorry, Solomon, excuse me, thank you, was around the age of 12 to 14 uh, during this time when David is leaving these words to him. Uh, And they calculate this age based on uh, a timeline of events uh, that occurred from the situation with Amnon and Absalom and, and all of those events leading up to from the, the situation with David and Bathsheba. Uh, and that puts Solomon right around 12 when, uh, when David is leaving these final words to him in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. <clears throat> so this would have been indicative of kind of David in his words to Solomon for his bar mitzvah, which is kind of a coming of age of Jewish boys. You know, that's kind of when they're legally considered... Uh, men is at the age of 13. So this would have been a common thing for fathers to say to their sons, you know, hey, it's time to grow up. It's time to be a man. It's time to, you know, start learning how to take over the family and to run things in my stead and that kind of thing. So that would have been, you know, the types of words that that a father would have said to his son at at that time in life. Um, When we look to historians, we have Josephus, who was a first century Jewish historian, Uh, He says that he was around 14 uh, during this time. And then there's another historian by the name of Eusebius, who is a 4th century Roman uh, uh, historian, um, who actually uh, agrees with Josephus and says that he was around 14 years of age. They, they use as a part of this also uh, the, the Hebrew word uh, ne'ar. And I know I'm butchering that. Anybody that's uh, good at Hebrew, um, it, Please don't, don't uh, quote me on that one. But anyway, uh, it's used in 1 Chronicles 29 when David is making this public announcement and talking about, uh, talking about uh, uh, Solomon. And, so, and, and then again in 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon uses the same word in reference to himself. And this Hebrew word actually means a young boy or a lad and really means anything from birth to adolescence. So from birth up to about 12 to 13 years would be the age group that this uh, Hebrew word, ne'ar, is in reference to. Uh, And so kind of putting all of that together, we have a very young Solomon. However, interestingly, when you look at kind of the other side of this, from about the 19th century on, uh, historians and commentators have stated that uh, they really believe that Solomon was really more around 18 to 20 years old during this time instead of the originally thought 12 to 14. Um, A part of this really has to do with the fact that Solomon has already uh, got a son. He had Rehoboam, his son. So when we look to the end of Solomon's life and we look to Rehoboam's reign, it says in 1 Kings, give me a second, 1 Kings chapter 14, Uh, Verse 21, when Rehoboam dies, it says that he died uh, and he took his reign at 41 after Solomon had died and Solomon reigned for 40 years. So that means by this time that Solomon is receiving these words from David, Rehoboam's already a year old. Um, So that would mean that Solomon would have been between 11 and 13 and already having a child, which is uh, not unlikely that such a young boy would be married, uh, being part of royalty, uh, but would still be very, very unlikely for him to have sired a child who was already a year old at around the age of 11 or so. Um, so that kind of creates some discrepancies that are hard to, to kind of hard to, to, to shore up here, at least in my mind. Um, also, when we look to 1 Kings chapter 11, it talks about Solomon being old. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 4 says that for when Solomon was old, and then it talks about his heart being turned away from God, um, that uh, you know, even given the life expectancy of the times, calling somebody in their late 40s, maybe early 50s old would be a little difficult. But if you put him in his late 50s, uh, to, to early 60s, then it's much more likely that he would be considered, uh, even in the time, would be considered old. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of my research. I, I kind of lean more towards the, the 18 or 19 to 20 year old Solomon at this time, uh, as opposed to the much younger 12 to 14 year old. So, uh, and what was that, Daniel? So uh, Amy just let me know Daniel was David's second son, and his mom was Abigail. Thank you, Shannon Roulard. 
uh, for that. So Daniel was David's second son. And we really don't have anything biblically about his life. So we either assume that he just didn't care anything about the throne uh, or that he died at a young age. We really don't know either one. So as we get to this point and we're looking at uh, David leaving these words to Solomon, telling him first off uh, to grow up, we have David handing this crown over to Solomon and, and he says this, this kind of phrase, he says, prove yourself a man. When we look back to our, our lesson a couple of weeks ago, those of you that have, have been in the young adult class, remember when we were talking about David, and David was about 18 to 20. So if we look at an 18 to 20 year old Solomon, at this point in David's life, he's already killed Goliath. He's already a general in Saul's army. Uh, and leading Saul's armies into battle. So when, when we see David leaving this, these kinds of words or this wisdom, if you will, to Solomon and saying, hey, grow up, prove yourself a man, these, this is the perspective that David has when he says these things. Um, it's a very uh, war-ridden, if you will, perspective of life that Solomon's never had to face. Um, you know, David did, I think, what a lot of us do as parents is we try to give our children a better life than what we had. And you can see this in David. He's worked very hard for Solomon to not have to go through the struggles and hardships that he did. Uh, and, but now he's kind of at a point where Solomon, it's, it's, it's kind of on Solomon. And he says, look, you, you need to grow up a little bit here. Um, you need to realize the responsibility that you're coming into that's being thrust upon you whether you want it or not. Um, and you kind of need to prove yourself here, uh, and, and this is your opportunity. This is, this is my words to you. You need to prove yourself a man, and you need to stand up and, uh, and, and do something about all of this. Um, so, and it's, we see that Solomon takes this to heart. If you jump into 1 Kings chapter 3, just one chapter over, and we see the situation, the conversation between Solomon and God, and we see Solomon, uh, God offer him anything, and Solomon says, look, I just need wisdom. Um, he said, I'm like a, a, a small child. I don't even know how to go out or how to come in. And uh, so, so we see Solomon obviously took some of this to heart whenever he, uh, uh, whenever David said it to him. So, which is, again, amazing. Those of us that have or have had kids that are in that 18 to 20 year age range, uh, how many of them do you know of would ask for that if they're told by God, literally anything you want, just tell me and it will be yours. Uh, or think back to yourself when you were 18 to 20 years old. If you're given that blank check and told whatever you want, it's yours, take it, uh, would have asked for wisdom. Um, so it, it kind of does show us, at least at, at, at that point in Solomon's life, the character that Solomon did have, the concern that he actually had for the heart of God and the heart of God's people. Now, when we kind of look to this for us today, right, it doesn't just apply to young men in the church, young women in the church. This is really something for all of us. You know, I, um, if, if we have any of our elders watching, I, I, I don't mean this in any disparaging way, but we have elders who are not getting any younger. Um, you know, how, it's just part of life, you know, uh, so, but are we looking to that next group of elders? Are we looking at not just who's going to be elders in 20 years from now, but literally who are going to be our elders tomorrow? Are we as a congregation taking it on ourselves to, to train them, to mold them, to teach them the ways uh, of, of eldership, of leadership, of responsibility, of, of growing up and proving themselves a man or a woman of God such that when those opportunities arise, uh, not only are they willing and able, but they aspire to those positions of leadership because they know it's, it's the responsibility that God calls us to as followers of him uh, is to take those on. When we look at Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 1, and then uh, verses 6 through 8, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. This is for all of us, uh, especially those of us in the faith who uh, would consider ourselves to be mature in our faith. It is our responsibility to be doing this for all of those who are younger. Uh, and, and not just younger in age, but younger in faith as well. We have to consider that as well. 
Um, so, you know, I, I throw that out as, as a question to you. Are you taking that on as a responsibility to teach, uh, to teach men and women of God how to be uh, and how to take those roles of responsibility that God calls us to? We kind of move on from, from that and see uh, David then moves into verse 3. And he kind of moves on from, but kind of still carries that theme of, kind of carries that theme of, uh, you know, growing up and proving yourself a man. And he says, look, there are three different ways here that you can do this. We go back to verse three and he tells him, he says, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies that is, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So he tells him, look, you need to keep the charge of the Lord. This is how you grow up and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord. You walk in the ways of the Lord. And then you keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies. And we see kind of in the life of Solomon that while he began well, um, he kind of ended his life, I think, with some good thoughts. If we look to Ecclesiastes and kind of the traditional thought that it was written towards the end of his life, or at least finished towards the end of his life, we see some wisdom and some things in there that kind of he came back around and maybe back to himself. But like, really, what happened in the middle there? Uh, he, he, he left a lot to be desired, at least when it comes to following God uh, and the wisdom that he showed uh, especially early on in his life. So, so kind of how do we take that in, right? A lot of the habits that we form when we're young really shape who we are uh, when we become older. And this includes both in age and in faith. Just because we're, uh, we're older in age doesn't mean we're older in faith. Um, it may be, uh, there, there are many who are baptized later in life that are much younger in faith. There are many who are even baptized when they're younger, uh, but don't really take the responsibility and role of their faith seriously until much later in life. And then they begin to grow and they begin to mature uh, into the fullness of their faith. And so we have to take all of those things into mind, but what, but what, what habits are we instilling? I love that Sam is getting together with the teens this morning and that he has uh, some other times throughout the week to try to instill within them some of these things that even though we can't be physically together, there are still responsibilities we have. There are still things that we can do to stay in touch and to continue to build our faith with one another. We have to learn to obey. Uh, when we learn to obey, excuse me, while young, then it forms those habits that will shape us as we age and as we mature. And this applies across the board to all of us, right? As as we, if we forego the things of uh, the the acts of worship and service, when we consider uh, prayer and and fasting and the spiritual disciplines of. Uh, all these different spiritual disciplines and study of scripture and, and uh, worship with the saints. And when we forsake those when we're younger, we're much more likely to forsake those also as we get older. And so we need to consider that how, how do we build those up? And it's incumbent on us as a congregation to reach out to those. Uh, we have so many visitors in our church in our church that come in. We have so many here on uh, Facebook that are reaching out, that are a part of this, maybe that, that would never have an opportunity to come to our worship or to come to our church. Um, what are we doing to, to continue to reach out to them and to continue to, to influence and teach and train them? Uh, we, we have so many avenues and opportunities that uh, we can partake of this. So when we look to Solomon's word in, words in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He says, fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. Solomon sums it up. This is man's all to fear God and to keep his commandments. And anything that we do, Paul says, anything that we do that's not in faith is sin. And that's essentially what Solomon is saying here. Fearing God and keeping his commandments. That is our main responsibility. That's how we grow in faith. That's how we, uh, that's how we, we get to do those things that David is charging Solomon with. To keep the charge, to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, commandments, judgments, and testimonies. The final thing that uh, David leaves to Solomon 
is he tells him to teach your children well. Remember, again, Solomon has a one-year-old son, Rehoboam, at this point. Uh, And so David's telling him, leaving him this charge to teach your children well. He says, just as God promised David an heir on the throne, if he obeyed, then he passes this promise also on to Solomon. But there's a caveat. There's a catch in there. Solomon must obey as David obeyed. And even though David had some rough times and David did some things that that displeased and and angered God, uh, he never fully turned, his heart never hardened against God such that he fully turned his life or his heart away from him. Uh, He was quick to repent. He was quick to come back when sometimes it had to be pointed out for him, but, uh, but when it was, he was quick to respond and quick to repent as we should be. And as he's telling Solomon, look, you have a good heart now, but make sure that, that the goodness of your heart doesn't stop with you. You have to continue that. You have to continue to train your children uh, uh, as, as hopefully David has trained Solomon. And only if he remains faithful will God uphold his reign. Uh, we see this as a continuing theme throughout the kings uh, that if that king remains faithful, then God will continue to perpetuate his line. There are several kings. It's interesting. Uh, we even see, and we'll talk about a little bit more next week when we get to kind of the splitting of the kingdom, that uh, David, that because of David, there is a remnant of Israel, uh, which is just the tribe of Judah primarily, who is left to Rehoboam, to the line of David. And it's not because of anything that Solomon did. God clearly says that I am leaving this to Rehoboam, your son, because of your father, David, not because of you, Solomon. So because of the things that David did and because of the heart that David had, there is a long line of kings who are continuing to be blessed through Uh, through David and through his heart. The same thing can happen in our lives as we teach and train our children well, as we have a heart uh, for God, then we can have generations beyond us who continue to receive blessings from God because of the training that we imparted to our families and to our children uh, as they grew and as they matured. help them. We need to help them emphasize their faith. We need to help them find a faithful Christian spouse. Uh, that's very, very important. Those of you that are married and and you know how important it is to have a faithful spouse, To that so many of the difficulties in marriage and the difficulties in life can come from uh, two spouses or come from a, a, a from a husband and wife who are on different pages, who have different belief systems and and different uh, things that that drive and guide their lives. And so when we can help them to find someone who's going to be more in line with what we've taught and trained and help them to understand is the truth as we know it, uh, then it will help things in their life. So, So kind of to summarize and put all of this together, What are really the lessons that we can take away from David's charge? I like to leave each of these with three lessons uh, that we can take away. So the first one, leaders. We have to cultivate tomorrow's leaders today. Without this guidance, we're going to have a vacuum of leadership. Again, I I, I didn't mean this in a bad way towards our elders, but we have an eldership who's, who's aging. And, and as they do so, if we don't have men who are willing to step into that role as an elder before there is a vacuum of leadership, then we will start to have problems. We will start to see the ramifications of that within our own congregation. That lack of leadership uh, will cause problems and can, uh, uh, can negatively impact and affect our congregation as a whole. And also, how are they going to learn unless someone tells them? We look to Romans chapter 10. How will they know unless they're told? And and the same is true of leadership. The same is true of of being deacons and elders and all of those things. Um, We as parents and and as as those who are mature in faith in the congregation have the responsibility and the role to to take that on, to teach and to train, to, to stand up the leaders of tomorrow. As a church, we have got to prioritize obedience. I love that even in these trying and difficult times, we're still having 
and taking advantage of the technology that we have in front of us. Even just a generation before, things like this would have been impossible. But we have so many ways of connection now. And the fact that we're able, not only able to use, but actively using these ways of connection uh, when, when we need to, to for, for safety of the individuals of the congregation, to remain physically distant from one another, uh, still having this interaction and this connection helps us to prioritize that obedience that we know that God calls us to. And we have to consider prayers for, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to make us a priority in our life and to teach it to our children. We see that that teaching as we move through, teaching them to, be, to lead, teaching them to prioritize and obedience, and, and they'll see that as we do it. We have to consider prayers for revealed sin in our lives, those things which may hinder us and may hold us back from a right relationship with God. Understanding, uh, we have to un have an understanding of true service and what true service looks like. Uh, and, and we have to have a notice of clarity to make necessary changes to obey God more. Um, you know, we see that that was what Solomon was asking for in 1 Kings chapter 3 when he asks God for wisdom. He says, that I may lead your people, God, grant me wisdom, that I may lead them as you would lead them. The final thing uh, is for youth. We need to help our youth to choose faithful Christian relationships. And, and this says youth, this was, so uh, just to throw this out, the, the lesson overall was pulled from BibleTalk.tv. Uh, if you want some other good resources, you can go there. There's a different version of this lesson that he teaches and puts together there. I just got kind of the rough outline from, uh, from his lessons. But, uh, you know, it says to choose faithful Christian relationships. I think that not only applies to our youth, but again, to us. We need to choose faithful Christian relationships and, and to ensure that, that we, we build those, that we uh, nurture those relationships to make them what they should be. I mean, you think about it, uh, we're, we're, Lord willing, we're all going to spend eternity together. So if we can't be civil and friendly to one another here on earth in, in the limited time that we have, how do we expect eternity uh, to be the glory and the wonder that, that uh, the Bible says that it will be. We'll all be spending time together. If I can't stand you here on earth, it's going to make it difficult for me to, to spend all of eternity uh, in, in proximity with you. And so we need to build and foster all of those relationships one with another. We need to choose friends who can help us and challenge us to grow. A true friend is not one that, that just agrees with you all the time. A true friend is not one that, that says, oh, it's okay, that's just who you are. You just go do you and, and I'll do me and we'll be fine. A true friend is one who challenges you. A true friend is one who says, look, you know, the Bible says this, and yet I see you doing this. Those don't line up. How can I help you get to this biblical model? so that we can together get closer to God. That's what a true friend will do. Ones that will let you get by and stay in your sin, that's not a true friend. That's, that's just somebody, I don't know what that is, but it's not a friend. It's definitely not. So with all of that said, it was kind of strange teaching this way. Uh, I know everybody keeps saying that, uh, doing these, all these remote connections and things like that. It's, it's definitely interesting. Um, I missed having the interaction and the feedback, uh, the questions from the class. And, uh, uh, but I, I do hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate everybody who, who was able to show up. Those of you that would like to tune in next week, uh, we'll be looking at Solomon's most important meetings. And I have three readings. It'll be 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 3 through 15, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, and chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. And all three of those are the three separate instances where God revealed himself and spoke directly to Solomon. Uh, so we have three of those. And what I'd like to kind of pick out of those three, what we can learn from Solomon's interactions with God, God's words to him, Solomon's words to God, and, and just kind of pick out those interactions and look at kind of the timeline of Solomon's life, when those happened and, uh, and kind of what they meant during that time of his life. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for, for tuning in. 
And uh, before we go, I do want to kind of finish this out with a prayer, and then I know we'll be starting our worship service right at 10. So this should give you all plenty of time to, if you need to get any more coffee or get anything else, uh, get ready to go to worship at 10 a.m., then you'll be ready to do that. I would like to close it out in a prayer, though. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that you bless us as you do. We thank you, Holy God, that you are everything. We thank you, Father, for these avenues of connection that while we may not be able to be together physically, that we can still be together uh, in in this virtual sense, that we can still learn lessons from your word, Father, for it uh, truly has the words of life. We ask you, God, that you be with us throughout these trying times in our country and in our world and ask that you would help us to lean on you in all things, to have faith in you, and to exercise the wisdom that you give us, Father, that, uh, that the, and the common sense that we have. We ask you, God, that you would just please uh, be with us today. Help us as we worship you uh, at, at the worship hour at 10. And God, ask that you would just please be with all of those uh, that, uh, that are not able to make it as a part of this. Father, ask that you just please bless them, be with them, strengthen and encourage us all. And it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen.